Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing with our Trippy Let's Talk Lore series. Last episode, we left off as Liu Bei's forces celebrated a massive victory over Cao Cao's forces led by Xia Dun. While everyone was in a celebratory mood, Zhuge Liang's smile turned into a frown as he thought of the road ahead. Speaking to Liu Bei, Zhuge Liang warns that Cao Cao will surely lead an even bigger army to retaliate following Xia Dun's defeat. With their small force in Xinye, there is no way they could hold back Cao Cao. The only reason they were able to win this battle was not because of the fire that engulfed the enemy, but rather because we were able to burn away most of their supplies, so they had no option but to retreat. The only real chance they have is if they could gain control of the entire Jin province from the ailing Liu Biao. But hearing this, Liu Bei replies, Liu Biao sheltered me when I had nothing, so I would rather die in Xinye than steal this land from Liu Biao and his heirs. Seeing that Liu Bei is adamant about this decision, Zhuge Liang can only return to the drawing boards to try to scheme another way out of their predicament. Meanwhile, back in Xuchang, Xia Houdun reports back to Cao Cao, and just as Zhuge Liang has predicted, Cao Cao orders his entire army of half a million strong to prepare to march south. Since Liu Bei only has around 10,000 men, Cao Cao's goal here is clearly not only to eliminate Liu Bei, but also to conquer Liu Biao and Sun Quan as well. Liu Bei was simply the first stop for Cao Cao's march to unite China. To better utilize their larger force, Cao Cao subdivides his army into five battalions of 100,000 men each. The first battalion was to be headed by Cao Ren and Cao Hong. The second battalion was headed by Zhang Liao and Zhang He. The third was headed by Xia Hou Yuan and Xia Hou Dun, and the fourth was headed by Yu Jian and Li Dian. Finally, the fifth battalion was headed by none other than Cao Cao himself. Additionally, Xu Chu was tasked with 3,000 heavy cataphract as the vanguard unit for the entire army. When the orders were issued, one court official stepped out to voice his displeasure. Cao Cao took a look and saw it was none other than Kong Rong. Kong Rong argues that Cao Cao as the Prime Minister of the Han had no right to attack Liu Bei and Liu Biao, who are both loyal relatives to the crown. It would be an unjust war, and unjust wars often end in defeat. Now, Cao Cao wasn't going to let a few words or morality stop him from his chance to reunite China. So, Kong Rong was dragged out of court and told to shut up or die. Bitter about his treatment, Kong Rong left the court that day, but he continued to make statements predicting that Cao Cao's campaign will end in failure, as he did not have the rights. Unfortunately, his political opponents at court seized onto this issue and reported back to Cao Cao that Kong Rong is a traitor who has always prayed for ill will on the prime minister. Still angry that Kong Rong dared to speak out at court, Cao Cao finally had enough of this nagging and arrogant scholar and ordered for his execution. So right before Cao Cao marched out of the capital on the campaign that will climax at the Battle of Chibi, Kong Rong and his two kids, who were just seven and nine at the time, were all executed for insubordination. Now, since Kong Rong is a playable character in the game, I'm going to sidetrack here for a little bit and talk about Kong Rong's life, since his role during the Three Kingdom era was rather minor, so we'll probably never get the chance to properly do a lore series on him suspiciously. So now with his death here, I feel this is probably the best time for us to chat about him. Now, Kong Rong is a 20th generation descendant of Confucius. And what he's probably most famous for in China today is that he was a well-known child prodigy. Most Chinese children are taught the story of Kong Rong Rang Li when they're little. It is said that when Kong Rong was just four years old, his mother brought out a plate of pears for him and all his siblings to eat. From the plate, Kong Rong picked out the smallest pear for himself, and his father asked him why. Kong Rong answers that because he is the youngest, the bigger pears should go to his older brothers. This story will basically become an allegory that's similar to the saying sharing is caring that we teach kids in the States today. Aside from this allegory, Kong Rong grew up to be a scholar who produced many literary works. He was assigned to be an administrator of Beihai, but he struggled in this role as Yellow Turbans and Yuan Shao both had success conquering Beihai from Kong Rong. Later on in life, he mainly served at court where he utilized his fame and family name to become an outspoken critic of Cao Cao's policies. In today's world, he would be the child celebrity who takes to Twitter 
to meme and poke fun at political leaders. This obviously put him on Cao Cao's bad side, but for a long time, Cao Cao tolerated his behavior because Cao Cao did not want to be the one who executes a Confucius descendant. But Kun Rong's public support for Liu Bei and Liu Biao basically made him a traitor and provided Cao Cao with a legitimate excuse to finally silence Kun Rong. When Kun Rong died, he was 56 years old, so he had a nice long life during this turbulent time. Alright, let's go back to our main story. So as Cao Cao's army prepared to depart, Back in Xinye, Liu Bei received a messenger from Liu Biao. It turns out, like Zhuge Liang predicted, Liu Biao's illness has turned for the worse. As he lies on his deathbed, Liu Biao summons Liu Bei as he intends to pass on control of the entire Jin province to Liu Bei, who he sees as a more capable defender of the province than his two sons in Liu Qi and Liu Cong. Hearing this, Zhuge Liang is grinning ear to ear. but. Liu Bei refuses and tells Liu Biao that he should pass it to his oldest son Liu Qi and that Liu Bei himself will act as a regent to assist the young Liu Qi to defend their province. But just as they were discussing, scouts reported back that Cao Cao's 1st Battalion led by Cao Ren and Xu Chu's vanguard units are fast approaching Xinye. So Liu Bei takes his leave as he heads back to defend Xinye. Liu Biao, meanwhile, writes his will to pass the entire Jin province to his oldest son Liu Qi, who is currently deployed at Jiangxia on the southern fringes of the province to defend against a possible invasion by Sun Quan. However, before the will could be shared, Liu Biao's wife, Lady Cai, was furious as Liu Qi was not her son, but rather the son of Liu Biao's first wife. Lady Cai wanted her own son, Liu Cong, to inherit the Jin province. So she summons her brother, General Cai Mao, and the two of them plot to override the will. First, they kept the will a secret, and when Liu Qi came to Jinzhou to see his dying father one last time, Cai Mao closed the city gates and told him to go back as he was tasked with defending Jiangxia. So Liu Qi never got a chance to talk to his father before Liu Bao died. To make matters worse, when Liu Bao finally died, Lady Cai and Cai Mao wrote a new will to pass the Jin province to Liu Cong, and they held the news of Liu Bao's death away from Liu Bei and Liu Qi. Now, Liu Cong was just a 14-year-old boy at the time, so essentially, Cai Mao and Lady Cai took control of the Jin province. And the next big discussion is what to do about Cao Cao's invading army. Since they kept the news of Liu Bao's death from both Liu Bei and Liu Qi, they could not rely on them for help as they are more likely to turn into enemies once they find out how they have been kept out from Liu Bao's will. So, after some debate, Cai Mao suggested that the best course of action for them is to simply surrender to Cao Cao. In the beginning, the young lord Liu Cong was strongly against this idea, as the Jin province had been in their family's care for generations, so how can he just give it away on his first day on the job? But after a heated debate, where most of the court pointed out that Cao Cao is so strong that he has defeated the likes of Lü Bu, Yuan Shao, Liu Bei, and even the Wu Heng tribes in the north, that they really stand no chance even if they were to defend to the last men. Eventually, even Lady Tai came out to persuade her son that surrendering is probably the only way they can all survive this ordeal. So Liu Cong relented and sent out Song Zhong to travel to Cao Cao's camp to offer their surrender. When Song Zhong presented Cao Cao with Liu Cong's letter to surrender, Cao Cao was elated and told Song Zhong that he accepts and that to reward Liu Cong for his wise decision, Liu Cong continued to be the governor of the Jin province for generations to come. Fortunately for Liu Bei, who has been kept in the dark about all of this, Guan Yu was on patrol when he spotted Song Zhong on his way back from Cao Cao's camp. Having met Song Zhong before in Liu Bao's court, Guan Yu captures him and questions him on why he was coming back from the direction of the enemy. Having no choice but to tell the truth, Song Zhong tells Guan Yu of all that has happened since their departure from Liu Bao. Shocked that not only has Liu Bao passed away, but also that Liu Cong has just surrendered, Guan Yu quickly brings Song Zhong back to Liu Bei to inform his brother of the situation. Hearing this, 
Zhang Fei suggests that they should ride out to Xiangyang right now to kill Liu Cong and Cai Mao and take over the Jin province before Cao Cao attacks. But Liu Bei scolds him and says, how can we kill Liu Bao's son after all that Liu Bao has done for us? Just as they are debating though, Liu Qi's general, Yi Ji, arrives to inform them that Liu Qi has just learned that Liu Bao has died. Liu Bei turns to him and tells him the worst news, that not only has Liu Bao died, but Liu Cong had just turned over the Jin province to Cao Cao. Liu Bei tells Yi Ji to hurry back to Liu Qi so that they could prepare their defenses for the war ahead. Liu Bei then turns to Zhuge Liang and suggests that perhaps they should abandon Xinye and head west to defend a Fancheng to buy them a bit more time. But time was one thing that they did not have, for a scout rushed in to inform them that Cao Cao's vanguard unit had just taken over Bo Wang and were on their way towards Xinye right now. Just as everyone's heart sunk, Zhuge Liang turns to Liu Bei and says, Don't worry, my lord. We burned half of Xia Houdun's army last time they came. This time, I'll make sure we burn them all. To find out what new plans Zhuge Liang has hatched up, come back tomorrow as we continue with our lore series.